from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We're so happy now to say a few words to have um, the director of the astrobiology program at NASA, Mary Wojtek. So I'm not going to take up very much time because I don't want to cut into any of this discussion. I just want to um, thank David for organizing this. And just for those of you who don't know anything about astrobiology, just give you a very brief couple of words about it. Uh, I'm in the head of the program at NASA, and it's the program that is tasked with um, funding the research associated with looking for evidence for understanding how life evolved and originated on our planet, uh, looking for life or inhabitable planets uh, elsewhere, and for understanding the future of life uh, and its distribution through the entire universe. So we have a big job, and I think I have one of the best jobs um, in, uh, in the government. Um, I uh, am delighted that, uh, I know you heard a lot about Barry Bloomberg this morning. He was a wonderful man and, and uh, was a visionary, and it was his idea to take astrobiology, which is multidisciplinary and spreads out all, uh, amongst a bunch of different areas in science, and make it transdisciplinary and understand the relationship that every human being on Earth has with the topic and how important it is to consider it in, in a larger sense, whether it's through theology, philosophy, or societal impacts. And so it was his idea that a nice way to bring those two kind of disparate uh, areas that we think about in terms of research and understanding together through the vehicle of a chair at the Library of Congress. And I think it's been an excellent opportunity um, this building happens to be my most favorite one in the in the entire city, so it's it's nice that way. But also, um, it's just a wonderful opportunity to take care of this and uh, take advantage of this incredible resource uh, in our own uh, in our, our nation's resource. So um, I thank the Library of Congress for going along with with Barry's idea and for making it such a wonderful opportunity for individuals interested in astrobiology. And David, of course, was our very first, and I think it's been an excellent success, and we have our second coming on soon, and I've been asked to let people know that we're starting our search for the third one. And the applications, uh, the application is out on the street, and the applications are, or the, the solicitation and the applications are due December 1st. So all of you that have shown interest in this event possibly might think this is something you'd like to do um, and consider writing a proposal and we may see you here next year. So thank you very much for coming and participating. This is truly exciting and thanks for the opportunity to just um, say a few words. So thanks. Okay, let's uh, have all the panelists now um, come and uh, grab a seat or a stool. Um, thank you so much, Mary, and th thank you, NASA Astrobiology Program, for, for helping to make this possible. And um, any of you who have uh, questions from this morning or new questions you'd like to raise, uh, I'm going to just give the panelists a chance first in case anybody's got a burning point they want to make that relates to one of the discussions this morning, and then uh, depending on uh, how they respond to that opportunity, we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. Any of you guys? Are, are some of you guys wired, or do we all have handhelds? Okay, so we're just going to pass around handhelds. When you speak, please do speak into a mic um, as well. Um, that goes for the audience, too, because, you know, we're recording all of this, and actually, immediately upon completion, we're going to take this recording, and we're going to seal it in a vault on the moon, <laughs> just in case society collapses, so at least we'll have a record of this. Yeah, so... Um, any burning points? Ursula, I see you, you look like you've got a burning point. Go for it. <laughs> I'm not just burning, but I had a question about the... Um, Push the button. Um, so I had a question about the 
to the panelists of the of the last panel, um, and of course, I, I you know, as a science fiction fan, I could not not love um, the talk about you know intelligence on other planets and thinking machines. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I I, I love to read about and think about, obviously. But I was wondering if I could. Um, I, I could um, ask you to to sort of um, think a little bit more sort of about the um, social framing of some of these technological questions. And I was wondering, the the panelists of the last panel, um, if uh, imagine something much much more futuristic than intelligence on other planets or thinking machines. Imagine that over the course of the next century. Um, most of the decisions about um, agricultural technology, medical technology, and transportation technology were taken by a majority of women rather than men. How would, how would decisions be made differently? <laughs> wow. Interesting question. Yeah. Get, get applause for that. Um, anybody want to take a, a stab at that? Um, <laughs> I don't want to, okay. Sure, sure. I, I'll just a very brief comment, um, which is purely empirical based on my observations, is that I've noticed more women in astronomy tend to be interested in planets uh, than in, in cosmology. And so I think maybe the search for exoplanets and habitable worlds might actually be further along because there just seems to be a little bit more. And this could be completely wrong, you know, just venturing a guess. Um, maybe there's just more interest in that sort of interdisciplinary um, you know, uh, it's sort of the opposite of a reductionist approach. And so maybe men tend to be reductionists. I don't know. I don't know anything about men and women, so. You have, just, you have just perfectly evaded my question since I asked about medical technology, agricultural, and transportation technology. Not planets. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, some, some of us just interpret everything in terms of planets. I don't think yeah, well, which is fine. I understand that. I yeah. Actually, um, I'm really curious if I may. I'd love to reflect that question back at you, Ursula, because, uh, because uh, now I'm curious that uh, it seems like a leading question, and that, I, mean, I, I feel like maybe you have an opinion on that, and I'm, I'm, I, I would love to know what it is. Um, no, I mean, look, it's a reductive question, obviously, since we're assuming that, that women are this essentially category that is the same all over the world, but clearly when you look back over the history of the last 60 or 70 years, I mean, clearly um, a lot of decisions about reproductive technologies and how they were implemented, I mean, from the pill to, um, you know, morning after um, medication and things like that were made by a majority of men, not women. So clearly, you know, it starts, it starts right there. Um, it seems to me that, um, you know, I mean, obviously car design would be hugely different if women um, had been, um, had been in charge, you know, and a lot of, um, a lot of pointless fast cars would probably have never been designed and put in put in production. Um, agricultural technology, I think, is a is a little more um, is is a little trickier. Um, I mean, there's obviously um, people like um, the activist Vandana Shiva in in India um, who make a very strong point that that um, agriculture should be returned to um, a much larger subsistence basis and should be returned to. To women, and that that would be a significant, a significant uh, resistance against um, the way in which international agricultural and chemical corporations run the lives of a lot of farmers in India. Now we don't need to believe everything that Vanana Shiva says. Far from it. Um, but that's another question that, for example, didn't come up: the way in which a lot of agricultural technology is actually driven by a very few corporations. And that brings us to the question of capitalism that I think was quite cavalierly dismissed at the end. And um, Seth, I thought you were a little, a little cavalier there and saying, oh, well, capitalism just succeeded because we all wanted this stuff. Well, you know, um, certainly there's, there's some part of truth in that. And then there's huge, huge, I think, historical misunderstanding there. Um, in, in the sense that, I mean, certainly historically, I mean, pe yes, people found things to do with cars, but it was also Henry Ford saying, we got to have somebody to sell these cars to, so we're going to pay our workers a certain amount so they, can, so they can buy these cars. And you can't tell me that the current sort of planned obsolescence where we're constantly being forced to, to upgrade from one iPhone to the next and, you know, from one, one sort of uh, Roku and whatnot to the next, that that's really something that we choose. Um, that is something that, that to some extent we choose and to some extent we're forced into because, you know, our profession demands it, our kids demand it, our partner demands it, whatever. 
I'm going to make a brief reply because this is opening up a can of annelids that I don't, 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 don't really want to get involved in. However, I will say this, uh, to begin with, your assumption that muscle cars are totally pointless is, is, is wrong. Uh, it's, it's wrong because it gives teenage boys something to drive around and screech tires on, and they're demonstrating that they've got good genes. This is all, the, the males display, the females decide. So those, those muscle cars are all about display, so those are important. And you know, what Neil and I actually discussed over lunch that if humankind were to colonize outer space, actually it would be men that would not go. I mean, you'd have 100 women and then 200 pounds of sperm, and that would be it, right? Because we don't really need well, men. No, 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 so, if, you, if you have, so yes. So men would not go, so, so that might also solve the problem of these muscle cars. Well, I'm not going to dispute that men are obsolete. They may be. But, but let me also point out, and this has been pointed out by the biologists, that men are merely a genetic experiment being run by women. Because women make all the decisions relevant to reproduction. So I would suggest to the women in the room to look around at the men and say, you know, what a flawed group of whatever, hominids here. But this is a result of 10,000 generations of selection by women. So this is what you wanted. I can hardly believe it. Are you, are you kidding? I mean, have you, looked at anything, have you looked at any reports about the situation of women in Africa or India or Afghanistan lately? And you're saying women make all the decisions? I mean, I don't know where you're coming from. I mean, this, okay. this, is, this does seem to come from another planet, honestly. I think Odile has a, has a point. To, uh, push the button. I did. Oh, uh, push it. I did. Yeah. I did make that comment to Ursula at lunch. So I was thinking, okay, the idea of going and exploring other planets, I think, has traditionally been a male fantasy. Um, I don't know what women think about it if I had not thought about going to colonize another planet. But if you were to try and do it, and your goal were to make a repository of people who could either live there forever or hang on long enough to be able to go home to Earth, you'd need a long time, you'd need enough genetic diversity to not make us weaker. Um, and so how do you do that? The cost of payload to send a space mission, I think that you really want to drop the weight. Like there are, whole, there are people who spend their whole careers making things smaller to send them into space. So if you're going to take someone, I don't know, 185 to 210 pounds per passenger, and you could shrink that down to a couple ounces, you could take, let's say, 10,000 women and several million male samples with you and some IVF technicians, and I think you'd have your genetic diversity on that planet. So that's what I suggested. And to bring it back to something more serious, you're laughing, but we have priorities that are not all about survival and sensible decision making for the next space mission. We have things that we are expecting would happen if we were to go colonize another planet or if we were to take care of the ocean. That we have these ideas that we just consider externalities are not important, and I'd posit that they tend to lie in psychology, emotion, um, the humanities. So the concept, this gentleman kept bringing up the concept, he brought up twice the concept of dealing, how do we deal with the idea of dying? So this idea of living and making, you know, we just need to keep making more of us and we need to live longer and we should just send ourselves into space and live there until we can survive. We also, I dread that the cameras are on if I say this, but I think we need to talk at some point about the concept of how do we end these lives that we keep prolonging. Um, and those are difficult emotional questions. It, but if I give you the obvious technological solution, it would be to not bring any men to this colony. Um, you guys wouldn't get to go. We'd be going and swashbuckling our way onto the next planet. So anyway. Just for one generation until yeah. there's men again. Yeah, until there's men again, but you guys wouldn't get to go. And I think partly the travel there is the exciting part. It's the, you know, it's the sports car. It's <laughs> you know, there, there's actually a movie that made in the 1950s called Queen of Outer Space, which uh, oh, where, really? where uh, you know, it's a, it's a trip to Venus, and it turns out that it's, it's populated entirely by, by female scientists. And uh, it's a really, you might like it, but it stars Zsa Zsa Gabor, just telling you. <laughs> yeah. Stan. All of these are science fiction scenarios, and we've been uh, dealing in science fiction scenarios all day long. You start from the present, you try to talk about what the future might bring, and that's what we've been doing today. And it, as we see, it heads off in all directions. But the mark of good science fiction is that you start from the initial conditions of the time that you're actually in. 
So you start from now, and you don't end up starting from, say, 1950 or 1930 or some antiquated, uh, that, that's a different kind of fiction, alternative history or steampunk. But good science fiction starts from now. And so now, we're in the age of climate change. We're in the age of the potential overshoot, which is maybe there's more humans on the planet than the planet can support. You look at ecological footprints, you look at the situation we're in now, and the carbon problem and the capitalism problem, that we live in an unjust and screwed up economic system that is really a dominant. Uh, there's no one nation, there's certainly no one individual that can change it, and it rules all of us. Uh, because it's the, it's the way that we've organized society, and it's something we have done, and yet it's very um, difficult to change. And there are people that are really benefiting from it the most who are really unhappy with the idea of it changing, because they're thinking about self-interest in the way that uh, both Rick and uh, Ken talked about. So, um, Seth mentioned this, we're in unprecedented times. We've always been in unprecedented times, but I think it's true to say, because of this overshoot of the seven to nine billion, that it's more unprecedented now than ever before. This is a moment, a choke point, as Seth put it out. If we can get through the next century or two, if we can decarbonize our, our uh, energy and our transport systems, if we can make clean technology, if we can make clean ag, if we can make justice on the planet, it will all require getting to what I could call post-capitalism, where we take what we think of as capitalism now and reform it so intensively in a legal manner in changing the laws that we will get to what you might call the next economic order, something that is as different from capitalism as capitalism is from feudalism. Well, this is almost unthinkable. This is the, diff this is the science fiction imaginary that is much harder than planets or um, you know, thinking machines, blah, blah. All these things are interesting science fiction scenarios, but unless we get through the next couple centuries and actually manage to reform our economics and pay ourselves for the stuff that needs doing, then all the rest of these are no longer science fiction, they're just fantasies. So I like to keep on coming back to this uh, highly politicized, highly partisan topic of how do we reform capitalism to make it more humane and make it more uh, a permaculture. And you will get oddities, like Andy was talking about agriculture, you'll get things that will be both organic and genetically engineered. You'll get organic ag in 100 uh, story uh, skyscrapers in Holland and every floor will be producing vast amounts of meat in vats and, uh, and organic plants at the same time. In other words, our usual dichotomies will collapse and get strange, um, but the, the economics of the situation right now are the crux point. They're very badly messed up. They're unjust and they're inefficient in the best sense of survival. So it's fun to think about that one, I think. And Caldera. During the break, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson said something to me that got me to thinking that, and I think it's quite profound, uh, and that is that if we think, you know, what are the key pleasures in our lives or what makes us feel good? You know, it's things like being loved by your spouse, by having good friends, you know, eating a good meal, and, and that all of these things don't involve advanced technologies or big CO2 emissions or anything like this. And so that, you know, one of the problems that I said about that we're self-interested, but our, self, our conception of how to satisfy our needs has been distorted and perverted through constant advertising and social systems so that, you know, we think we want that new technological device or we need to fly across the world to do something. And that, and that, and that maybe there's a way forward where we try to get in touch with what we actually want and that if we and actually need and that if we really focused on what on our true self-interest rather than our imagined self-interest that we'd be a, a lot closer to working in the collective self-interest so turn off the television and or don't pay attention to those commercials telling you what, what, what they want you to want. <laughs> if we had ads on TV every night saying this heroin is better than that heroin, you should shoot this heroin, and no, 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 you're better off with this cocaine, you know, we'd all be drug addicts and instead we're addicted to consumer products and it's, you know, we just have to realize that 
that thinking we're going to fulfill our needs by buying, uh, thinking that we're going to fulfill our emotional needs by buying another product is a failed uh, effort. Anybody else on the panel want to um, advance a topic or start a conversation before we open it up to, uh, to the audience? Um, okay. Um, yes. Um, we're, um, ah, Jason's got the microphone here. Um, and then uh, you're next uh, over there. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> It's a good thing he's in good shape. This is an unanswerable question about the relationship of science and religion from a philosophical standpoint. Um, of course, the increasing secularization excel of since the scientific revolution. Um, where does that end as far as religion goes? Uh, Kant says that there were four basic questions. What can I know? Epistemology. What should I do? Ethics. What may I hope? Religion. What is man or humanity? Well, science can perhaps get, provide us answers, substantive answers, perhaps cogent and, uh, uh, answers in several of these areas. Uh, what may I hope, he says, religion. W.H. Auden wrote an essay called Death Comes from the Behaviorist. Here is a, is a, a positivist. His, his scientism has no answer for death. Suppose, suppose we become machine intelligence. Suppose we attain a kind of immortality. That, that undermines the uh, uh, existential basis of a religion. But I'm trying to say is even if you get that far, in the far distant future, what should I do? Can you derive ought from is? Can you derive values from a scientific uh, understanding of the empirical world? And, and so will there always then be a room for some kind of religion, if not a surrogate like Marxism, some kind of ideology to provide these non scientists Marx presumed it was a science, some kind of non-scientific philosophical framework for understanding the world, or will that be considered uh, anachronistic and outmoded by scientific advances? Sorry. Stephen. Yeah, I'll take a shot at that. I have written a, an article called Cosmo Theology, where I make a plea for uh, people to take into account what we know about the universe, which is that we are the end point of 13.7 billion years of cosmic evolution. Uh, cosmic evolution has been called genesis for the third millennium. We believe, we can't say with 100% certainty because science, that would be making a religion, but uh, with 90 some percent certainty, I would say, we believe that there was a big bang and that cosmic time has unrolled over the last 13.7 billion years. And so that, in a way, is a genesis story based on science, and the question is, what do you do with that? Well, a lot depends on you know, what's out there, and this is where you get into the question of extraterrestrials again, and there's been actually quite a bit of work done on this, and uh, there's a, a long, long history on what would be the theological implications if we found extraterrestrial intelligence. For example, what does it do to the Christian doctrines of redemption and incarnation if you have to have a planet-hopping Jesus and that sort of thing? Uh, and, and that Oriental religions would be less affected. So there's a lot of room for more thought here in a systematic way, which hasn't been done, but uh, um, I think uh, uh, well, I'll let some, some, some other people go, go take it from there. Rick. Just to, uh, to follow up uh, a bit on that, um, I, I think that, um, I, I think of the scientific community as a, um, um, as a community that uh, takes debate and doubt as a, of one another as uh, a foundation for, for the activity uh, and of um, coming up with um, stronger, um, uh, more empirically tested uh, explanations about the world. But that be does become a matter of is and an explanation of, of is. Um, the articulation of that is with religion is that it's easy to use the word religion in a singular way, but it's hard to practice religion. A person practices particular forms of religion and that one learns in the cultural diversity that exists uh, on earth specific 
ways of believing that don't necessarily, that have their own integrity uh, within those, within societies, um, but don't necessarily form a worldwide approach to understand the, the universality of the search, of the spiritual search, of the religious, of religious yearning um, that um, may actually prove a bit more productive in the sense of a, a cosmological, um, a, a sense of the, of the universal. And this ties into uh, comments that have been made previously, uh, including by myself this morning, about a, a planetary and a one species uh, embracing diversity, but a one species narrative, uh, is to try to understand how uh, science as a worldwide endeavor, as contentious as it can be, uh, with uh, articulation with the universality of human uh, yearning and uh, the things that can define the ought in ways that science cannot. Thank you. Uh, did you have a quick point, Ken? Uh, might be a version of this, but I, I think I'm with Hume basically, and think you can't get an ought from an is, and that I think scientists have values, and values drive what questions we ask and how vigorously we pursue them. But basically, science is a methodology for falsifying statements, and uh, as such, you're not going to be able to falsify value statements. Seth, and then uh, Jake. Yeah. Okay. Uh, obviously, this is a very, very big question. And the Templeton Foundation has actually sponsored symposia where you, they bring together scientists and theologians and try and see what the, the interrelationship is. And the only, I've only been to one and it was a failure. It was here in DC. And it was a failure actually because of the scientists. Because the, the scientists were very hard-nosed about this. They weren't willing to, you know, seek any common ground. But I just suggest a few things to you. Uh, you know, I think having ethics, for example, in terms of the second point you made, how to behave, I don't think that actually requires religion. But it is interesting that when Captain Cook, for example, explored the South Pacific, every island he went to, they all had religion. Okay, so whatever it is, it's very universal, at least for our species. So when people ask me, if you could actually contact ET, if you actually get a signal, what would you ask them? And the question I, <laughs> I think I would, I, I, I can't decide. I would either ask them, do you have music? Or I would ask them, do you have religion? And suppose you ask them, do you have religion? And they said, no, how would that affect you? Let me just say one more thing about Captain Cook. It was interesting that, you know, he'd sailed into, you know, the, the, I don't know, the, the bay of some island there. And the natives, all of whom had their own religion, as I say, they would see these guys have, you know, they've got big ships, they've got metal, they've got gunpowder, they've got syphilis, they've got all this stuff, right? And they all threw over their own religion for his. So here's something to think about, that if we actually find the aliens and they have a religion, that we might decide to join theirs and join the galactic church. Jacob had a point, and then... Oh, yeah, just a, a, a brief point. Um, I, 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 I think I agree with you in that science as an empirical investigative tool does not give us a moral or ethical system automatically. Uh, but I do think it can help inform those systems. Uh, Carl Sagan said, I think, that... Uh, Science is a profound source of spirituality, or at least it can be. Um, I'm thinking, you know, if you sequence the human genome, you now realize that across vastly different cultures, we're actually fundamentally the same at a genetic level. That you don't automatically get an ethical principle out of that, but you can certainly derive one from it. So I think science is not a replacement for what religion or faith fulfills in our lives, but I think science can help to inform that very deeply. Yeah, I mean, Sagan talked about in, uh, increasing our identification horizons from just individual family to tribe to, you know, ultimately to identifying not just with humanity but with all of life. And in fact, scientific knowledge in a certain sense encourages that way of thinking because the more we learn about the microbiome and about the, the genetic tree of life and everything, we realize that that's, that's just not a nice thought, that in fact we do have this very deep unity with the rest of life and perhaps as you say that can guide an ethical um, process even if it doesn't completely supply it. Steve, and then we have another question. Yeah. So, uh, Seth mentioned the Templeton Foundation. If you're interested in following this up, uh, there's, I'd suggest a couple of things. Uh, one is a volume that I, I happen to have edited uh, based on the, one of the very early Templeton meetings. It's called um, Many Worlds, 
the new universe, uh, extraterrestrial life, and the theological implications. And there you'll see people like George Coyne, who was the director of the Vatican Observatory at the time, and people from other religions discuss these issues. Also, I'd recommend Ursula Goodenough's uh, The Sacred Depths of Nature, which talks about the epic of cosmic evolution as a universal genesis story. Excellent. Yes. Thanks for such a you know, stimulating discussion. I have two questions. The first one is, does emotional intelligence exist or it is just made up? Number two, with the evolving uh, science and technology, what are the significant impacts on human values, especially equality and uh, just society? Wow. Does emotional intelligence exist and what are the impacts of evolving technology on questions of uh, justice and human values? Wow. Um, deep questions. Anybody want to respond? I'll take a quick stab. I would say that I'm not, emotional intelligence must exist because my wife has more of it than I do. So I, there's an existence proof there. Anyway, the, um, <laughs> the uh, you know, on values, you know, while I was saying that science I don't think directly leads to values, I think the scientific community leads to strong values of you know, internationalism, treating people based on you know, what they can contribute and do and not based on where they're from or other irrelevant characteristics, that there's the idea of openness and transparency and reproducibility and working collaboratively. And so I think the scientific enterprise promotes lots of good values but that the scientific results themselves should be value neutral. Yeah, that's a really good point. And there's a lot of historical examples during the Cold War when the United States and the Soviet Union were threatening to blow each other and the rest of us all to bits. There were two separate space programs. The, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were competing to send missions to Mars and to Venus and so forth. And the scientists on both sides were doing everything they could to get around the restrictions and escape their KGB handlers and whatever and exchange information with each other because from the point of view of the scientists, it really didn't make any sense to have the Russians send a mission to Venus without knowing what we've already learned about Venus so they could make their mission better. And, you know, the, science is a culture with selfishness and greed and all of this, but there also is this ethic of people actually wanting to get their answer right and wanting to share information. And it does promote, as Ken said, this internationalism and this sort of pan-individual goal. And I think in that sense, it can act as a, as a powerful model for the kind of thinking we've been talking about. David, can I add that um, um, the scientific method is a utopian politics. Uh, that tries to enact itself in the world by the kind of uh, behaviors that Ken was describing. So that w there's no division to be made here. Science is not just mathematics, it's not inhuman. It's a, it's a set of behaviors that we legislate and then enact um, by agreement. And so what it finds about the world is, is really out there, but how we uh, operate it is a human thing that has always pressed towards equality and a utopian result, and, and that should be acknowledged more. And I also wanna emphasize this thing I've been saying recently, that justice itself is a technology in the sense that softwares are technologies. Therefore, we, and technology is not just the machines. Uh, like these cameras up here, okay, those are technologies. But the legal system that we live under is a software. And so computers, they ha you have hardware, you have software. Without the software, the computer's just a hunk of metal and plastic. It's complicated, but it won't work. Only the software makes it work. So um, laws are a kind of a software. It's technology that we change all the time. And what it does is it runs civilization. It runs human affairs. So, and I'm saying that since justice is a kind of technology that makes the world run better, because if we had justice, then we'd have a stable population, we'd have adequacy, we'd have less war, we'd have less violence, we'd have more health, we'd have more happiness, that justice itself is a life-enhancing technology. So it, I think it, although these are confusing two sets of terminologies that we try to separate out, 
I like to mash those together because it tells the stories that I think are more accurate to the way that we live. Ursula. I just wanted to add a very quick thing, sort of more about technology than science, that I think it's really hard to generalize an answer to your question because just because a particular community comes up with a technology doesn't necessarily predict how it's going to be used. Um, so if you think of the classical historical example of gunpowder, which was, which was first developed in China and wasn't really used for, for um, arms or military purposes, but it was used for fireworks. And when it was invented in Europe, it, it was used for military purposes. So it's not necessarily the technology itself that dictates what's going to be done with it. To me, the other comparison would be with, with languages. I mean, you can say anything in any language, but there are languages that make it a lot easier to say certain things than others, and there's more straightforward things as, of saying them. So there are certainly particular kinds of technologies that will make social developments easier or harder, but I don't think that there's any sort of determinism coming from new technological developments. Or the reverse is also true. I mean, it's, it's uh, when you look at the history of science and technology, it is sort of unpredictable which kinds of knowledge and which technology are going to evolve where. I mean, the classical example here would be um, the enormously sophisticated signs of astronomy in Maya culture, but the fact that um, they had wheels, but they, the, the wheel had been discovered, but they only used it in toys, not for transportation, which seems incomprehensible, um, sort of for, viewed from our, our technological viewpoint. So, so I think there, there's a really complicated um, intermeshing of, you know, power relationships, who says what gets done, who says, you know, who even has the means to discover new kinds of technologies, who gets to implement them, cultural values, religious persuasions, and social structures that, that make this really, really hard to generalize about. So it's a very tough question. Oh, deal? I, I might be taking a more pessimistic view here, but um, there's a difference between science and technology, and Ursula was just alluding to that. If I take technology to be defined as the ways in which we transform materials to make tools, right, and that tool could be a legal system, it could be something um, tangible. Technology and the way we make tools today is it's governed by a capitalist process, right? And so Andy Revkin, before he left, um, he had to take off, but he was talking about the intertwining of technology and commerce. Um, it's very difficult to disentangle them. So the making of tools, whether it be fuel for an automobile, an automobile, uh, a cup, a fork, um, that's often dictated by commercial interests. So I can talk from, I use, I think plastic works very well as a proxy for talking about global change and consumption. I think it's partly because you can see it. It's kind of, and it's colorful. It's one step easier to see than the ozone hole. Um, plastic was not a, it is not cheap to make one thing out of plastic. Right? It's actually the natural resources are quite expensive. Uh, so let's say you have to chop down a tree or you have to go and drill into the earth and pull out oil um, and then process those. To make one plastic fork would be quite expensive. But plastics works very well. The technology works very well as an economy of scale. A lot of metal works this way too. Once you've got the molds and the machinery and the facility and the people all in place to make these things, if you can run off 10,000 or 100,000 of them, quickly, then you've got something that's economical, it's efficient, and it's going to make you a profit. So then how do you go about making a profit? Because that's how our economic system works currently. Um, you go about making a profit by selling a lot of those. Um, so here we've got a bunch of people, we all work in either the public sphere or in the academic sphere. We're not necessarily working in the commerce sphere. But if you want to make a lot of money off selling the same thing again and again and again, right, how do you do that? Well, you have a war. World War II is how plastic came. It built up uh, really quickly because we had so many soldiers that we needed to outfit. Um, and when that ended, it came, came to someone's mind that, hey, it would be really great if we could get someone to use something once and then throw it away and do it for such a basic human need like eating or smoking or drinking that we could get them to have to buy another one every time they do this. 
right? So we've done, we've embraced this, and that's maybe a, a simplistic and cyn slightly cynical view of why we consume the way we do, but there were very real economic motivators for why we buy so much stuff. So to take it back to the religion question a moment, a little while ago, we pick our values partly because they're given to us in a top-down way, and they're given to us in a very sparkly way right now. Um, we're sold a lot of shiny stuff that we're told we have to have. We compete against each other to have more of it. Um, so does technology serve us necessarily for good? Um, I'd say if you take it in the context of how it's currently driven by commerce and marketing, that there's actually a very real um, motivator for us to consume too much and that that's maybe part of what takes us away from justice and out of balance with what we need to be sustainable. By the way, interestingly, two of our panelists are not in academia or government and they, they do sell things and that's because they're, they're, they're writers. And, but, but what they sell doesn't necessarily um, ultimately need uh, to um, lead to more manufacturing of things, right? It can lead they to... Write, they write it, in the public service. Right. So Both, uh, David, uh, both David and Andy Rifkin will write in the public yeah, service. Yeah. Um, yes. and, I, and I also want to point out that it's, it's fascinating to me that o Odile can relate any subject to plastic, even, <laughs> even religion. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Well, they all do. Yeah. Oh, um, I see a question over here. And then I'll get you guys. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, I wanted to uh, just do a quick survey of what the threats are to the longevity of human civilization. Uh, OK, asteroid collision, probably very low probability. Uh, mega volcanic eruption. Uh, might devastate western the U.S., but low probability. It could kill a few hundred million people. But uh, Mike Rampino did an estimate of this. It could be a, a serious threat to extraterrestrial civilizations. Uh, then we have the continuing threat of nuclear war, even a limited nuclear war, which could lead to collapse, at least temporary collapse of civilization. Uh, from the climatic impacts, and perhaps Ken could, uh, you know, sharpen that up. But the biggest threat is the threat of climate catastrophe. Uh, that will be inevitable, unlike the others, unless we curb carbon emissions pretty quickly. So then uh, the theme of this symposium uh, is can we save ourselves from, uh, let me sort of read this. <laughs> uh, will we survive our world-changing technologies? We could have put another, we could have said, will we survive overshoot of population? Will we survive industrialism, as many Greens say, you know, industrialism is a threat. But I heard the C word, capitalism. And so the, the ruling elites don't really want us to discuss political economy uh, because that's more of a threat as uh, Stan, uh, Stan pointed out, that's a threat to power. Uh, so when we have a discourse about this, it depends on where we are. If we're in Bolivia at the right of, for Mother Earth, they would say the threat is capitalism. I mean, millions of people over the world are now recognizing, as Stan was pointing out, that this unjust system perhaps is leading to its terminal phase. I mean, every other socioeconomic system had a certain lifetime, and then it collapsed or was overthrown. Okay, and I'm not suggesting violence here. Uh, so what is the obstacle that we face to overcome to prevent climate catastrophe? And I think in doing so, we'll also prevent the threat of nuclear war. And I, uh, Eisenhower, uh, I think, identified it, 50, what, 60 years ago. He called it the military-industrial complex when he left office. Uh, I, I've uh, described it with a longer name, the military industrial fossil fuel nuclear 
state terror and surveillance complex. That's what's at the heart of real existing 21st century capitalism today. And uh, this may be uh, unpleasant to some people to hear, but I speak my piece, and I think we need to confront this obstacle if we have any chance of preventing climate catastrophe. We need to reach the political tipping points before the climate tipping points. That's, I think, our biggest challenge. Okay, I'm being shut up now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you, you, you said a lot, and there, there's a lot to, lot to parse there. And we appreciate your, your, your passion about this. And, and obviously, parts of what you said are in, con in consonance with a lot of, of uh, some, some of the concerns that, that we've voiced here. Um, I would just like to, like to quickly respond. I actually think that the threat of, um, of self-induced global warming type climate catastrophe is not really our biggest threat. It's our most imminent threat. But as far as, if I were to step back and say, what do I really think are, is, the most, is the largest existential threat to, the human, to human civilization surviving, I would say that it would be the lack of developing uh, a healthy long-term relationship with technology, which is why I phrased the question that way. I think global warming is in a certain sense maybe our first real test of that, but it's not the only one. And in the long run, the climate of Earth is not something benign. In the long run, uh, whatever we do now, there will be another ice age, there will be quote, natural changes to the earth that uh, will not be healthy for our current civilization. So, so that development of a relationship is not just about how do we avoid destroying ourselves and, destroy, and damaging the biosphere with technology. It's also in, in the long run, how do, we, how do we get a handle on this thing and use it in a healthy way to promote, to, to promote survival? There will come a time, regardless of what you think of geoengineering now, and that's something we actually haven't gotten to that much, but I know some of our panelists have a lot to say about that, but there will come a time in the long run where we, we will need to do geoengineering because the earth left to its own devices will not be a healthy place for us to survive. So I think that, that this development of a relationship when we're talking about the long term, there are many stages to this, and getting over our current orgy of resource use and atmospheric pollution is, uh, is the first in what we need to see as a longer series of uh, connected survival challenges. Uh, David started his question by saying, what do we see as the biggest threats? And I, I just want to throw another one into the hopper in case you need something to keep you up late at night. You're probably thinking the biggest threat is reality television, but that's not actually what I'm going to suggest. It's biohacking. I find that actually kind of scary. Uh, I just uh, happened to visit a biohacking outfit down in Sunnyvale, right, right close to where I live, actually, and they set up this lab so people can come in. It has all the equipment you need. You can buy it, essentially, on eBay, all the stuff you need to engineer, you know, your own life in your basement, in your garage, okay? And that's a lot of fun. What these guys were doing was they were trying to produce trees that glow in the dark. As an astronomer, I have to say, I'm not entirely down with this idea, but, and, and you could say that that's fairly innocuous. It might be rather decorative, you know, the entire Pacific Northwest glows, okay? But the point is that somebody, there always is a small fraction of the population that's malevolent. And they can also use that to design viruses for which we have no natural immunity because we've never confronted that kind of DNA before. So that scares me. I just want to say I appreciate everything that the speaker said, and it's nice to have you say it because then I don't have to say it and be the, uh, the, the what would you say, the radical leftist in the, uh, in the Library of Congress. So God bless you for that. Um, um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, the, the, the problems we are facing are all uh, amenable to a solution. And so um, it's within our powers to create a civilization where everybody has adequacy. 
So the first thing we need to do, I think, is avoid a mass extinction event, because extinctions we can't walk back from. And the big mammals that were going, all the other mammals except for the domestic creatures we eat, they're all in trouble. It's a bad situation, and so we need to readjust our, our relationship to the uh, biosphere such that we share it with other mammals and don't have a mass extinction event. So that means charging ourselves for burning carbon and not putting burnt carbon in the atmosphere. And all that has to be paid for and, and made economical. I mean, we actually have to just price it right, pay for it right. Then there's a billion people on the planet going to bed hungry every night. It's not necessary in a technological sense. We've got the food, we could do it. So these rearrangements will take away the people that will be angry enough to uh, uh, put a virus out there and kill everybody. And you can reduce a lot of anger by creating equality and justice. And all of these are just straightforward uh, social engineering projects in the best sense of democracy doing what it needs to do. So that the, the kind of fear-based stuff that you hear in this culture, like there's not enough for everybody, so you need to be selfish. Or you'll never be healthy unless you hyper-consume. These kind of messages that are coming out, these, they're stories, and they're, they're often science fiction stories, but you don't even have to call them science fiction stories. I'm saying that because they're future-based. They're simply stories, and so the stories that we tell rule the way that we live, and so the stories have to be the right stories. They have to be realistic, they have to be positive, they have to be inspiring. I mean, these are, it's important to tell the right stories. Oh, uh, uh, Ken and then, and then Rick. So I, I agree with you that Again, that I don't know whether it's uh, what labels for political systems you want, but uh, I mean, obviously, social systems that lead us to direct our efforts towards maximizing a broader domain and not just our own personal 1%. Uh, I, I would like to maybe push back on whether climate change is really the big existential threat of the century. And, and and this is as somebody who spends most of his life working on climate change issues, and, and that I, I think it's an important one because it has to do with like, can humans conceptualize the time scales and, and, and what, what this meeting is about? Can we live with technology in a way on the, as if we're going to live on this planet for the long term? And so I, I think it's a test case of being able to deal with central and difficult challenges. But, you know, obviously if you're a coral reef, if you're an Arctic ecosystem or something like that, you're in big trouble. If you're a marginalized person in the Sahel, you're probably in big trouble for many reasons. But, you know, there are things like nuclear war. I'm probably more likely to be killed by a nuclear weapon than by climate change. And I'm probably more likely to get killed by some virus than by climate change. And so I think it's an important one and an important test case for human civilization to deal with earth-changing technologies, but it's, as a personal threat, I don't think it's the biggest threat. Rick. It, it may seem uh, odd in the light of such uh, practical considerations um, to step back and look, try to look at lessons um, that come from the study of human evolution, um, but I do it um, in the uh, same vein that the, the novelist Barbara Kingsolver um, said in, uh, uh, wrote in her book, The Lacuna, um, the past is all we know of the present, or all, sorry, the past is all we know of the future. And that's not meant to mean we look back at the specifics of the past in order to understand the, the future, but that our experience is all that we have in relation to develop principles of understanding survival, understanding what it takes for human thriving, what it takes to help produce human, a, a meaningful uh, human life and, and a, a meaningful globe uh, in the not just anthropological or anthropocentric sense. Um, we live in a, um, a time right now which is running an experiment that's never been tried. Um, and what I mean by that from the standpoint of climate um, is that, you know, if we had the problem, and I really do believe this, that if we have the problem of a directional change in climate, and that's what we have to solve, eventually we will solve it. There will be some people, in fact, minimal estimates of a tenth of the human population would be displaced from their way of life with even a one 50 centimeters to a one meter, centimeter, uh, one meter rise in sea level. And at this stage, we're talking about 700,000 to 900,000 people 
that's going to create a lot of suffering, a lot of, a lot of problems. But if that's all we had to solve, I think we would still solve it. The problem comes with, I think, this matter of environmental uncertainty and unpredictability, which means that our political and our economic and our decision-making, including our religious faith systems and scientific systems, have difficulty dealing with things that are unpredictable, that are trying to solve things where there are uncertainties, but largely because there's so much social, political, economic debate as to what to do because it's not just one problem. What's going on is that we live on an earth that is inherently uh, unstable, and human beings are now adding the new factor in that we put particulate matter up into the atmosphere, we change the distribution of water over the continents, we do a whole variety of things that were the foundations for changes in, from stability to instability of climates in the past. And so we're a new factor adding to an already um, dynamic uh, Earth system. And so when I, I, I presented this, this idea and the evidence behind it uh, a number of years ago to an economics think tank uh, here in Washington, D.C., some of you know it, uh, called Resources for the Future. And I pointed out that over the course of human evolutionary history, the thing that that was the difference between species extinction and species survival and thriving were those species that retained a certain level of maintaining options and diversity and ways of doing things, basically flexibility or resilience that I talked about and others have talked about earlier, um, that those were the ones that, that survived and were able to, uh, uh, to thrive. And so I had an hour with the economic modelers after um, my talk, and they said, listen, if we understand you correctly, then we have to develop economic algorithms and models that are not optimization models of finding the right solution, the right economic solution, the right political solution, the right social solution, but rather you're saying that we need to find algorithms and models that maximize options the number of options that maximize diversity. Uh, diversity of economic systems, diversity of behavioral systems in general, cultural diversity. And I said, bingo, I think you've got it. And they looked at each other and said, we have no idea how to do that. <laughs> um, and yet I think it is a lesson from the past, again, maybe a ridiculously long-term perspective uh, in hominin evolution about what um, ultimately persists and is capable of evolving and you need to have the diversity, the variation, um, and we need to try to find ways to maximize that. And so I think if our question is, what is the, how do we change from one economic system to another that works better? That's the wrong way to go about it. We need to try to find ways that somehow maximize the um, multivariate ways in which humans interact with and respond to the world. Thanks. As an astrobiologist, I'd just like to say there's, there's no such thing as a ridiculously long-term perspective. Um, we had a couple of hands in the second row here, these two gentlemen right next to each other, so why don't we uh, save Jason some running around and give the mic to one of them, and then you can pass it to your, uh, your neighbor when you, after your question. Thanks. I'd like to ask you for your thoughts on Fermi's paradox. And let me just frame that a little bit. Um, in the last 10 years, there's been all these discoveries of the apparent robustness and perhaps inevitability of life and perhaps intelligence of the cosmos. I'm thinking of exoplanets, um, um, high new, um, uh, I, I forget the word, uh, you know, highly resistant bacteria that can live in all sorts of environments, um, theoretical biology, suggestions of convergence in evolution, suggestions of convergence in intelligent brains, the way they evolve. So there are these multiple converging lines of evidence that life and maybe intelligence are not just rare, but common. So that would seem to make the Fermi's paradox that much more painful and much more difficult to explain now than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, it may even be something of an in in intellectual crisis. If the James Webb Space Telescope discovers evidence in exoplanetary atmospheres, of oxygen, of non-equilibrium atmospheres. 
it would become increasingly hard to explain away the fact that we haven't yet discovered any traces of technological life out there. So I'd like your thoughts on Fermi's paradox in the light of science and theory in the last 10 years. Let me just quickly uh, explain, in case anyone here doesn't know, uh, the gentleman is referring to Fermi's paradox. And Fermi's paradox is the question that uh, was uh, first framed by a uh, famous physicist Enrico Fermi in the 1940s. And it's basically asking the question if there are extraterrestrial civilizations, and given the fact that for a very advanced civilization it wouldn't take that long to travel through and colonize and explore the entire galaxy, that long compared to the lifetime of the galaxy, given that, then if they are there, then where are they? And it's basically an argument, in a sense, for saying, well, if they were there, it would be obvious they're there, so therefore, they're probably not there. And that's, that's what he means by Fermi's paradox. Now, uh, answers, I see uh, Seth um, chopping at the bit. Uh, not chopping at the bit. I mean, Michael, I think, knows my answer to this because he's heard me speak on it before. But Fermi's paradox is drawing a very big conclusion from a very local observation. We look around and we don't see any evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence, and we conclude that since they've had more than enough time to get here, and they're not, unless you're among the one-third of the American public that believes that they are here, occasionally <laughs> hauling people out of their bedrooms, uh, then that means they're not there. But again, this is drawing this very important and huge inference from this local observation. And you know, yesterday I stepped out into my backyard and there were no brown bears in my backyard. And yet there's been plenty of time in the history of North America for brown bears to get to my backyard. Would I be correct in assuming that there are no brown bears in North America? Well, obviously not. And, and I think the, the fact that we don't see them, it could mean that they're deliberately cryptic. I mean, there's, there are books, and you know this, I think, but there are books that go through the whole laundry list of possible explanations for this. And I think all you can say is, it's an intriguing discussion point, useful at cocktail parties, but unfortunately, I don't think you can say anything terribly important in science about it yet. Maybe this relates back to our previous discussion that maybe the societies that want to colonize their own planet and then go out and colonize the rest of the universe are, are not sustainable and maybe it's only the ones where people focus on the, the more narrow local interests that are sustainable. So maybe it says something about technological societies rather than intelligent life. It's interesting you should say that, actually. Jacob Hakmizra, one of our uh, panelists, uh, wrote, wrote a paper, or at least is, is, is co-author on a paper, I, I believe, uh, which is um, the, the, the sustainability solution to, the, to Fermi's paradox, suggesting that those, uh, those civilizations that uh, aggressively colonize are those that um, don't exist anymore. So it's one possible answer. Um, yes, sir. Uh, by definition, we cannot predict when and how the unpredictable will occur, but we know that mutations will occur from time to time. Uh, among others, babies are born who, when grown, change the world. Da Vinci, Alexander the Great, Einstein, Mozart, Pythagoras, St. Francis, Da Vinci, Gandhi. And the Wright brothers are nice incidents because there were four Wright brothers, two of them did nothing fancy, and two of them changed how we get around the world. Uh, another world-class curmudgeon was Thoreau. Someone was telling Thoreau about the wonders of the new telegraph machine, and Thoreau said, what if Texas has nothing to say to Maine? Which there was no answer for. Uh, but I'm impressed by the banality of so much of what's on the internet. Things are also going on, but the danger of clogging our information veins or something is real too. Thank you. Any responses to that? No? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for your for your comment. Oh, um, yeah. Question here, and then we had one here, and and uh, uh, somebody patiently waiting over here. But uh, yeah, go for it. So. Um until that game-changing technology is developed, which makes fossil fuels obsolete, 
um, we find ourselves in a situation where highly educated CEOs of uh, dominant industries, think oil industries, irrationally deny the global warming effects of fossil fuels. And this is really strange because they go to the best universities and it's irrational. It's a political problem um, because of influence of these big industries on government and even the main media. And um, that public is actually ahead of um, these large industry thinking. Um, and um, so why is this? And one thing that's occurred to me is that maybe these large billions of dollars act like a drug on the brain, like morphine, and just, you know, can't, it, and it disenables these, you know, highly educated CEOs from actually thinking straight. And the other problem we have is the conservatism that's built into large institutions. Um, in this line, I was struck by an article about a former CEO from Mobile, who's now retired, maybe some of you saw the article, but um, he, was in head of, he was head of the development of all of South America and North America, but now he's retired, and he, uh, the issue of fracking came up, and he studied it, and he immediately saw its dangers, and he's in the opposition. I wondered if he would have been possible within an institution to have the intellectual freedom to allow himself to think these thoughts. Um, so I guess um, that's my comment. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, self-interest itself is, seems to be a powerful drug affecting one's uh, judgment of these uh, these questions sometimes. And it's, you know, just as a member of the scientific community, I can say it's, it's sort of an unprecedented challenge for us trying to sort out this very diff difficult technical question of what's going to happen to our planet if we increase the CO2 and do all these other things. And we're trying to have an honest debate, and science needs that. Science needs its skeptics and its critics and its different points of view. And we're trying to do that, which is what science does, in the face of this withering well, first of all, the bright lights of public scrutiny, but also there are these self-interested parties who are blasting us with messages that are biased and intended to obfuscate and intended to, to confuse the issue. And so it's really, it's, a, it's an unprecedented and very difficult situation for the scientific community to find itself in. And um, they, they, I, I think you've identified one of the key um, aspects to it that makes it so difficult. Um, did, uh, yeah, go ahead. I think that, um, I mean, first of all, what you said is right, that, that people have good defenses against uh, information that would challenge your own self-interest. But, but the other side is that there is information that has led many leaders of fossil fuel companies to say that CO2 is a potential environmental harm, and that is after they looked at the, the history of the tobacco companies where their internal scientists were telling them it was real, and they were making public statements saying it wasn't a health hazard, and that let them open to lawsuits. And because the scientists working for these fossil fuel companies are telling them that climate change is real, a lot of the fossil fuel companies are saying, oh, this has an environmental hazard, so use at your own risk and your own responsibility, and we're not responsible for it. And so to limit liability, most of the companies now are not uh, denying the reality of climate change. Interesting. Just throw out another provocative idea. I was a little bit surprised that in all the, the discussions of energy, because there's been a lot of discussion of energy and fossil fuel and so forth, that one technology that's been thought about for at least 30 or 40 years has never, didn't make it into the discussion. And that is simply to put up satellites, that you know, power sats. In other words, giant arrays of solar panels, if you will, better solar panels than we have today, but they don't have to be that much better, that collect this energy in space, in orbit, then they beam it down on microwaves, Right? And you can make that very low impact. It doesn't even cook birds. Not that I'm against cooking birds. But, and, and then you collect it on the ground and you distribute the energy. Uh, it, it's a, a capital, capitalist, uh, capital cost. I mean, it got sucked into the capitalist discussion. It's a capital cost problem at the moment. But at some point that becomes economic. And at that point you now have a source of energy which you can run most of our activities that doesn't involve burning anything. There are no emissions really zero emissions. 
I also talked to a guy at the National Ignition Facility that's in Lawrence Livermore and they're working on nuclear fusion a couple of days ago because fusion has been in the news recently. This is the promised power source of the future. We're supposed to see it within five years, ten years. He was telling me two years ago, we're going to be building plants, fusion plants, within two years. He said that two and a half years ago, and we're not building them, but when I pointed that out to him, that was very uh, inelegant of me. But what he said was, look, it's going to take another couple of years, but what's a couple of years when you're talking about replacing so much of the energy needs of the of the world by not burning stuff. That's just shuffling electrons around. That's a very primitive way of getting energy. And there are these other possibilities that eliminate a lot of the problems. Ursula. If I could just add a footnote. I mean, the climate denialism is certainly a, a serious problem in that it slows down the passing of sensible policies. Um, but whether it's lying or self-delusion or whatever it is, or indeed I think the, the comparison with the tobacco industry is apt, um, I think it's also interesting to see how it's distributed. I mean, you have climate denialism mainly in the U.S., Canada, and Australia, which are all three countries that have very, um, very large extractive industry sectors. You look at Europe, there is no real problem of climate denialism there, but that doesn't solve the problem of fossil fuel burning and climate change there. So, I mean, some European countries are doing a little bit better, but on the whole, emissions there are also still going up. So, um, denialism is part of the problem, but it's not the whole problem. The whole problem is, is, you know, what other kinds of energy sources do we have that we could replace this with, even if those um, CEOs were finally to admit that, that, um, that fossil fuels are causing the problem. David. So, we're going down the back row here. Well, the, uh, the, the pithy way to sum up the drug that you're looking for is uh, if a man's livelihood depends on him not believing something, he won't believe it. That's just, it's that simple. Um, and changing the energy system is an enormous undertaking. It's this invisible network of pipelines and uh, electrical transmission lines and all these things that we don't think about because all you think about is the socket, the price of gas and the things that affect your day-to-day -day life. It actually enables your day-to-day -day life. We're going through 14 you know, terawatts of energy each day, 80% of it fossil fuels, and two billion people don't have access to any of that. And we gotta extend it to them and replace the 14 terawatts. That, the scale of that problem is unlike anything else we have ever faced, and uh, honestly, whether you're looking at nuclear fusion or solar satellites, those are fossil fuel technologies. You are mining the metal to make those satellites. You are using coal to forge the steel. You're burning a ton of fuel to get those satellites into orbit or a ton of energy to get those little pellets to start fusing. Um, we have a long, long way to go to solve that energy challenge, and that's why kind of interim technologies that are not that exciting, like carbon capture and storage, and in fact somewhat terrifying, may prove absolutely vital, and we, we ignore them at our peril. Thank you. I think we have time for uh, one last question, and, um, oh, okay, then, um, sir, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to return to the concept of the singularity. I heard skepticism on one side and I heard uh, supportive comments on the other all day long today. Um, first of all, I think, I think what's taken in the, in the singularity, what's taken from the physical concept from the collapsing black hole, is simply the event horizon. Is that there is, with this event, with intelligence, uh, machine intelligence being affordable and surpassing uh, human intelligence, it's just a, a matter of this event horizon that once that happens, we can no longer tell beyond that point what that disruption is going to lead to. And I thought the example was very good before of, of, of this other forms that we've seen of singularities, uh, for instance, nuclear weapons. But not so much when they were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but more the event horizon for nuclear weapons was seconds before the test at Trinity. We didn't know whether it could be done and whether it could be practical. Once it happened, the genie was out of the bottle. And I think that's the same with the, with the uh, uh, information technology singularity. Once it happens, 
we really can't project beyond that because we don't know. Complete disruption in the fabric of what we understand to be history. As far as Ray Kurzweil goes, he hasn't been wrong on many of his projections, and he has heavily relied on numbers and statistics. He's, he's done his homework. So when, when we hear that in perhaps the 2040s that we will see this singularity, where this crossing point will occur, we, we should take it seriously because it's based on real science and real numbers and studies. The reason I go back to the ethics piece that I was talking about earlier today, too, is the urgency on all this is that we have to answer that question as we get towards that point. Because, and this gets to the point on, on, on class divisions in society, the unfairness, the disparities, and everything else, we better make sure that the software, whether it's a neural net uh, uh, type software, we better make sure the weights and the constraints and everything that's built into it is, has a democratizing effect. Because if it still has these parochial characteristics built in that come from the inventors, us, at that point, then these class divisions and these economic divisions will only be amplified. I think Marx referred to it as the superstructure that preserves the status quo of the class relation, relations of production throughout society. And that will be extremely destructive when it's enhanced with that tool. Look at what nuclear weapons have done by themselves. So I just bring that out on the singularity. I just, I, I just want to make sure that people understand Ray Kurzweil's position on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I personally am not a believer in Ray Kurzweil's techno-rapture uh, prediction. I, uh, I understand what you're saying, that it's based on numbers, but, but for me personally, I believe it's also based on assumptions about the nature of the human mind-brain system, which are untested and um, perhaps not even likely to be true, that, we're, you know, that you can draw a simple analogy between a fast computer and what it takes to make a, a human brain. I know there are different opinions on that, but, um, but that, that's my view. But, but, but what I do think is that uh, it is quite likely that in the next century there will be unpredictable game-changing technological breakthroughs that will radically change our world, and it might be nuclear fusion that actually works, or some energy uh, breakthrough that really um, gets us out of the conundrum we're in now. And that, you know, part of what's interesting about this uh, attempt at, uh, at framing the future is that we, we really can't do anything about our, our inability to, to to uh, our, our failure to be able to foresee these game-changing inflection points. And in, in a strange way, that personally gives me a lot of hope because I see a lot of people making these, these uh, linear extrapolations of current trends and being full of doom and gloom and saying, oh man, we're really in bad shape because, uh, you know, just project all these things about population and energy and climate and boy, what are we gonna do about it? But I also see that um, as, uh, as that wise uh, woman in um, the Terminator movie inscribed on the picnic bench, um, the, there is no fate but what we make. So um, that's, uh, I think that'll probably be my final thought. Um, other panelists? You want to say that Kurzweil in this situation is telling a science fiction story. And um, he's a, maybe an excellent scientist, but it doesn't matter. He's still just telling a story about the future. And I am a science fiction writer, and I recognize it when I see it. Very excellent historian, um, Karl Marx, wrote science fiction. Uh, as well as doing excellent history, he also predicted the future. His was wrong. Everybody doing science fiction ends up wrong. Okay, And so, Kurzweil, this idea of an event horizon that comes out of physics is a metaphor. And in fact, it doesn't obtain. Um, we're, uh, thinking machines is a really fuzzy term because thinking is actually a very big word talking about a bunch of different processes, some of which we understand how they work. A lot of them we don't understand how they work, especially inside the human brain. We don't understand how we think. We don't have a handle on that. We can't, therefore, make a machine that thinks like we think. So uh, in 2040, uh, this is my prediction, this is my science fiction story, we're still going to be looking at a variety of technologies that are complex, that we're only semi in control of, but it's a completely uh, transparent relationship. We'll still be uh, dealing with them. There won't be any singularity, because the definition of that is a science fiction story that I don't think comprehends uh, quite well 
the brain and the relationship to computers. So I have a fundamental disagreement with that story. And I think I can back it up at more length. This is, this is actually a complex philosophical discussion and you have to get into a really close parsing of what you mean by intelligence, which is variable. And now we know, like for instance, intelligence, we used to think it meant rationality and that emotions impeded intelligence. Now we know that emotions are crucial for intelligence and you aren't intelligent without your emotions. Well, we didn't know that until uh, uh, recent years in brain science. So that was a great advance. But it, as I said before, at a certain level, we run out of our ability to comprehend the brain because it's happening two, three, maybe 10 magnitudes smaller a level than we can investigate in a living brain. And so that's too small. At that level, quantum effects may be going on. Um, human consciousness may involve quantum mechanics, which <laughs> we are a very uh, complicated relationship with our understanding of quantum mechanics. So uh, given all those things, I just think let's, re let's make sure that we keep it in mind that these are all science fiction stories. They're scenarios. And, and not feel that any of them are just inevitable because of technological deterministic progress. It's not working that way. Any other final thoughts among the panelists? I disagree with Stan, but we've already laid those, those positions out. Let, let, me, let me just say this then, and that is, you're gonna to live to see whether Kurzweil's right or wrong. We hope so. <laughs> and then maybe a lot longer. <laughs> David, I just want to reemphasize the very first point I make, which is that pretty much everything you heard on the stage today will probably be wrong. Like the high-speed train on the first cover of Scientific American, we were really glad to go 40 miles per hour, and it changed our lives in really good ways. And 2040, who knows? But I think it's going to be pretty awesome, and I can't wait to get there. All right, well... Uh, thank you very much. I think that's a, a great last word. Carolyn Brown has uh, some brief uh, final remarks, and um, I personally would um, really like to thank you all for coming and thank our panelists so much, some of them for coming a long ways and for, for helping us out today. Uh, Carolyn? Um, well, first, I want to say you've been a fabulous audience. This is the first all-day symposium I've ever been to when there wasn't a lag after lunch or in the afternoon. Um, so this has been really quite amazing. Um, I want to encourage you to uh, sign up in the back if you want to know more about Kluge programs, but also to be sure that when our next and future uh, astrobiology chairs do major programs that you get to hear about them. And if you sign up, that will happen. Um, also, many of you in the audience are probably likely applicants for this chair, um, and certainly many of our panelists, and I ask you to think about that. Um, as Mary said, the deadline is December 1st. You've got plenty of time. Um, finally, though, I want to um, thank our wonderful panel uh, for being here, for uh, the um, spirit of their opening remarks and the discussion. And special thanks to David, who made all of this work, who thought it up, made it work. And as I said at the beginning, if you thought this was terrific, the credit goes to David, finally. <laughs> thanks so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.